Welcome to the Health Information and the Law Perspectives from the Field interview series. Today we are speaking with Marette Mendefro, who is the Chief Medical Officer for Amita Technology Solutions. Welcome, Marette. Thank you so much for joining us. We're very appreciative to have your time today. Uh, we have a series of questions that we'd, we'd like to review with you and, and are looking forward to our discussion. So jumping right in, please tell us about your work and your organization with respect to uh, health information and the exchange of health information. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, Amita is an open source data company with a long-standing track record in health. Our CEO, uh, Peter Levin, co-created and led the Blue Button Project while he was the Chief Technology Officer at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I was actually his White House Fellow at the time. Um, so we've been working on health informatics, gosh, for the past um, six years now, actually, and obviously a lot has happened in that space. Uh, Blue Button has gone on to be the most widely used personal health record, and our company has built on the success by building other Blue Button components. Namely, the tool or software we've built is called the Data Reconciliation Engine, the DRE, and it's an infrastructure component that essentially accepts health data in a variety of formats and consolidates it into an easy-to-use structure. So the DRE allows enterprises and consumers to reconcile health information from different sources um, into one single master health record. And, you know, we believe um, access to health information is a, is a vital precondition for enabling um, a value-based care system, enabling patient-centered care, because it allows consumers to actually have the means and uh, the opportunity to make informed choices about their health. That's wonderful. And so obviously over the last six years you've seen a lot of changes. What, you know, what have you sort of noticed sort of the most prominent ways that the healthcare system itself is changing in terms of the way health data is accessed and used? So historically, um, health data has, has been trapped, right, in institutions uh, with proprietary systems and customized data formats. Um, on top of that, there have been poor incentives, misaligned interests, and HIPAA regulations that have all kind of made it difficult to share this information. And that's that climate is what has drastically changed. So now we have standardized formats. Um, formats like the blue button and incentives between stakeholders. For example, payers and consumers are, al are aligned in a way that they never have been in the past. It's actually in the interest of payers to know everything they can about their patients in order to take care of them better instead of using, you know, health data to select out the sickest ones. Um, I think in addition to that, you know, consumers now have a legal right to access the information on their medical record um, in electronic form which means institutions actually have to share it by law. Um, and there are obviously also financial incentives for sharing this information that institutions never had, thanks to things like uh, meaningful use. Um, and I guess the, the, the last aspect of the change that I think is particularly important is the growing consumer demand for this data. Um, because of things like wearables and fitness tracking devices, consumer behavior is actually changing when it comes to wanting to access data, and the healthcare system has to rise up to meet that demand. So for all of those above reasons, the landscape of, of um, health data and how it's accessed is totally changing. That's, that's great. And actually, for, for some of our audience members who may be less familiar, would you mind if we took a step back and if you could provide perhaps just a brief overview of, of Blue Button and some of the components that you're building to further enable Blue Button? Sure. Um, Blue Button uh, started uh, really at, at the VA. Um, the first pilot project was at the VA, and it was essentially a way for veterans to get access to their care. And you know, it partly leapfrogged the standards discussion. I mean, the first version of the blue button was literally an ASCII file <clears throat> that made it easy uh, for people to get um, their health information. And, you know, CMS then joined on um, and it grew wider. So there's multiple kind of formats, but essentially it made it easy to extra extract the data. And then HHS took over the Blue Button project, um, and it's become kind of a service mark, um, and they started to market it more widely. So now even private sector companies, lots of payers, um, insurers actually um, have pledged to do the Blue Button. So I think at this point it's over 500 private and public sector organizations 
Um, and it's become less a format and more a way of talking about access to data. So if you log into patient portals, you might see that icon, that blue button icon. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by it being an actual service mark. Mm -hmm. And so we ingest multiple kind of blue button formats now with the DRE. Um, and essentially, it's more a back-end tool we've built, actually. Most of our customers are actually enterprises. And so um, we are in the weeds of the data plumbing and actually allowing, helping our, ent our, our enterprise customers ingest various formats um, into uh, uh, an easy-to-use structure. That's great. And so thinking about, you know, looking ahead, you talked about how some of the barriers uh, to sort of access and use of health data um, have been tackled in terms of the proprietary nature, um, misaligned incentives. Obviously, you mm -hmm. referenced the Meaningful Use Program and growing mm -hmm. consumer, consumer demand. What do you think still remain as the most significant barriers to um, continuing to further use and access of health information, both on the provider end as well as the consumer end and, and others who are in the, the life cycle of, of the healthcare system? Yeah. In my opinion, I think, you know, the most significant barriers continue to be cultural. It's actually not the technology. There's actually great technology um, that allows you to do this. Um, and by cultural, I'm really referring to essentially the lack of an enabling environment to um, support the growing demand consumers have for their data. Um, and also the lack of an enabling environment um, to make it easy for providers to share that. So I think framed alternatively, you can talk about these cultural barriers also to just supporting patient engagement and encouraging patients to actually own their data. What the meaningful use requirements lay out is kind of ahead, unfortunately, of where institutions are still at. Um, you know, and a very practical example are patient portals. Um, patient portals exist right now, but they're kind of anemic and they're not exactly a top priority for a lot of institutions, obviously. You know, there are exceptions <laughs> to this, um, but I think from what I've seen um, in the work with Amita, patient portals continue to be kind of an afterthought. And if they do exist, the very limited utility of the data and the scope. So it doesn't certainly engender or encourage further use from the consumer side. And I think part of that or part of that cultural problem is reluctance institutions still have to kind of share this data because there's still a question of ownership. A lot of institutions still believe patients don't own their data, and that's a real problem. You know, I mean, you, you just have to, you you can kind of understand how widespread this problem is, is if you just look in, into your own kind of health care use and ask the institutions where you receive care, you'll be surprised um, about what some of the official policies are around who owns this data. Um, and that's, that's a problem. Obviously, it creates a tension between kind of the growing consumer demand uh, for health data and, you know, the structures that are set up um, in order to, to meet that demand. Um, but overall, I think we've focused almost too much on the provider side of the equation. I actually think there's a lot more that needs to be done on building the demand side of the equation. Um, far too many consumers are still not participating in their care in the ways they should and still don't know that they have the right to access their health information um, in the way they, they, they do. I have elderly parents that I, I take care of and, um, you know, I was trying to get my father's health records and it was, it was actually a battle. <laughs> I couldn't even, you know, I couldn't quite believe how hard it was for me to actually, um, you know, uh, get it, and I'm obviously an empowered and, and um, educated in, in the universe of health data. So I think we have a long way to go with changing the culture around it. And when you say institutions, reluctance of institutions to sort of share and release information, I just want to clarify my understanding is you'd be talking about hospitals, um, physician practices, other healthcare providers in general where people are interacting with the actual healthcare delivery system. Right, right. I think I think largely hospitals, right? I mean, I've interact I have less interaction with the kind of smaller provider mm -hmm. care networks in my current position. I'm mm -hmm. I'm more dealing with large hospitals and enterprises. But yeah, I would even include some of the payers in this, right? Okay. Um mm -hmm. yeah. I'm I'm fascinated too by your comments about consumer engagement. It's it's I think it's a challenge and one of the things that struck me, I was recently at a meeting um for the Office of National Coordinator where there was a group of payers who were presenting on their efforts related to encouraging their provider networks to 
share and exchange health information um, in, in greater rates. And what, what actually struck me, frankly, was sort of the, the, the focus uh, on their provider and their provider networks, obviously, but the fact that they really hadn't sort of jumped the hurdle to thinking more about patients. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really intrigued by your comments about sort of encouraging, pushing consumer consumer demand, because I think that's the other side of the, the coin, frankly, that's received less attention, and I think, frankly, as, as you've noted, has been one of the, the barriers. Um, mm-hmm. I think probably just, you know, as you mentioned with your elderly parents, you know, sort of maybe uncertainty about what they can or can't access, um, mm-hmm. hesitation on the institutional perspective in terms of what they can and can't share or the payer perspective. Mm-hmm. So what have you found sort of working with your hospitals and sort of the larger enterprises in terms of ways to break down that those cultural barriers or to think about ways to better enable or empower or inform consumers to be more engaged in their health care? Yeah, you know, I think technology has a real role here. Um, that's why I'm so excited about what Amita is doing, about putting technology actually in the hands of users that could um, start to build this culture around, um, you know, patient-centered care, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the idea of patient-centered care has been out for quite a while, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a new idea. Right. It's just that we haven't been practicing in a system, i.e., we were in a volume-based system where, you know, listening to patient voice and certainly empowering patients wasn't incentivized on any side of that equation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think part of what technology can do is help put people truly in the center of their health information flow, right? Um, so, exa- for example, when, when that happens, you know, issues like or barriers in the past like HIPAA kind of go away because it's actually the patient who owns right. the data, right? right? HIPAA was, people always forget, HIPAA came up at a time when third parties were exchanging all of this information, right, mm-hmm. um, on behalf of patients. It's mm-hmm. a whole different conversation when you're actually saying, actually, it's the patient that's in control, right? So I think part of how you build demand And part of how you change culture is empowering patients with tools like technology that make it just easier for them to do that, right? Mm -hmm. I think the other piece of it is, you know, there needs to be a lot more done around patient education um, efforts when it comes to kind of demanding these rights. Because I I think that, you know, a lot of people don't realize, um, once again, that they have this right to access their health information. Like when I told my father, he had no clue, <laughs> you know, right. that, you know, the doctor was supposed to provide this information. And actually, there's even a time requirement around mm-hmm. how, you know, how long you should wait. And guess what? If you don't get it, you can actually complain. Mm-hmm. And the idea, you know, for patients, and obviously, you know, I, I've taken care of patients as well, that um, they can kind of talk back to their doctor, mm-hmm. so to speak, mm-hmm. is also a bit um, foreign. So, mm-hmm. you know, some of this is a, having a broader conversation around, you know, health literacy, actually, right? And just even changing the dynamics of how, of how people think about participating in that care. And, you know, at Amida, we, we very much believe that access to actual health information, your health information, is the first step in kind of redesigning um, the flow and engendering a new culture around how you access access data. So that's, that's, that's great, and I think that makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned earlier that patient portals exist, but they're somewhat anemic. They haven't been sort of widely adopted on the patient end. Uh, mm-hmm. In your reference to sort of technology and putting technology in the hands of the users, have you found that there are particular types of technology or forms of technology that are better suited to consumers or that may have a, a better chance of sort of um, sort of helping to break down some of these some of these barriers to patient access? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know about types, but I think about with technology, I think about functionalities. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, very critical for all portals to have that view, download, and transmit mm-hmm. capability, right? There's still tons of portals that are just views, right? right you can just right. kind of look at it, but you can't actually interact with your data, right? Mm-hmm. In order to empower patients to actually have a voice in their care process and to, you know, own health um, and, you know, the, the holy grail of patient-centered care, which is shared decision-making, mm-hmm. shared power, people have to have um, not only the access to view it, but they need to be, you know, they need to download it. They need to talk with their caregivers, talk to people about it. So they need to actually interact with it and use it in some kind of way, right? And then they need to be able to, in order to do that, you need to be able to share. So all three of those functionalities are actually incredibly important, um, I think, um, as well as, you know, I think the other functionality is this idea that that conversation 
that hopefully the access to health information is starting needs to be bi-directional. So it's not just about kind of receiving, right, the information from the medical record or from your laboratory or from your pharmacy, but it's also patients having the ability within these portals to actually upload their own notes and thoughts about care so that the communication can truly be something that is shared. Because the minute you enable something like that um, through technology, the entire flow of that clinic visit will, will now change, right? Can you, you can imagine a situation in which a primary care provider will have seen what the patient concerns are so that when they that when that patient walks in, you don't have to wait for them to kind of share that information. You can kind of say, oh, I see that, you you know, these were some concerns. Let me address that. I think those are the kinds of proactive steps providers have to take in order to kind of level the playing field, so to speak, in the clinical encounter. So I'm thinking about, obviously, greater access to and use of information by the patient population in particular. Have you seen or experienced issues in terms of data integrity or data security that are involved with um, some of these forms of technology and the different types of functionality where you may have both providers and patients supplying information to the, the platform for the data? Yeah, you know, I think obviously data integrity, security, um, Amita actually is has a, has a um, cybersecurity background as well, um, but I think they're very important, but We've spent too much time focusing on data collection overall. I think the data is out there, and we have ways of making sure um, that we can access it. But I think, in my opinion, where we should be placing the focus more, especially from a policy perspective, is the focus on the actual use of the data. So, so the security question is actually, who is using my data and for what purpose? Right. So said differently, the question is more, is someone doing something nefarious or unauthorized with my data? And I don't think we're having that conversation um, in health IT. And, and there's good news here because there's actual technology that allows us to track the use of data. Um, and we need to start thinking very broadly about you know, what's called blockchain-like technology and the use of health data, right, which actually allows you to track flow of data um, and blockchain technology is widely applied in economics, you know, applications like Bitcoin rely on it, but it is yet to be applied widely in health and health data. And I think it really represents kind of the next frontier of, of policy concerns regar regarding access and security. So I'm thinking about that and thinking about the role of policymakers in particular. What would sort of be your advice or guidance um, for policymakers in general to be thinking about that would help Further, as you're, as you're saying, greater focus on the use of data, um, and then also thinking about who's tracking and, and using the data for particular purposes as well. Well, I think we need to look, I, I mean, I think we need to look outside of health to mm -hmm. see how other spheres are dealing with this. You know, uh, one thing that's very clear to me is although 95% of Amita's work has been in healthcare, you know, issues of data interoperability and security and integrity and, and, and use flows are obviously not unique to health, mm -hmm. right? Um, data accumulates in isolated silos in many sectors and individuals want on-demand access to their data in all of these sectors. Um, and there's ways that other sectors have kind of solved some of those problems that I think could benefit um, the health sphere, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think the, the application, I mean, of blockchain technology in the economics field and understanding that better from a policy perspective could be huge. Merritt, thank you again for joining us today. This has been a wonderful conversation about patient use and access to information and the tools that Amita Tech is building. We greatly appreciate your time and your expertise and look forward to further discussions with you in the future. Thank you.